scripture reading this morning is from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. We're going to be looking at, at verses 13 to 23. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there and... <coughs> I can feel that tickle in my throat when I started. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and they left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and wailing, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, he took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that, that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Wow. This is an interesting passage. It's kind of neat that there were a number of prophecies that were fulfilled in the birth of Jesus. Um, many, many prophecies. Far too many to go through this morning. Uh, but as you begin to see all these different prophecies fulfilled, you almost can't have any doubt that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the chosen one of God, uh, that that baby in the manger is the son of God. Uh, God directed so many things to be just so and, and told us what he was going to do hundreds of years before. And, and then it happened exactly the way he said it was going to. Uh, I guess you could say it was divine direction, right? God had a plan and he directed everything to work out in that plan uh, to fulfill all those prophecies. I, I hope we'll see this morning as we begin another year together uh, that God can direct our steps. Uh, he can uh, uh, direct our lives, and direct our paths, and, and get us going in the right direction too. Now, in this section of Scripture... Uh, Following Jesus' birth, we see several prophecies that, according to Matthew, are, are fulfilled um, and, and through their fulfillment provide even further proof that Jesus is the Son of God. That was Matthew's purpose in writing this letter, prove that Jesus is the Son of God. There were four of them in this reading uh, that we're going to look at, at each of what Matthew calls fulfilled prophecy, and we'll, we'll dig into those a little bit. Uh, I said there were four. There's actually three in this reading, and there's one we're going to pick up that happened just before this reading. Uh, we started reading in verse 13. The first one is actually in verse 6, um, and that's the first one we'll look at. So uh, uh, verse 6 talked about uh, being, being born in Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, uh, are, are by no means least of these rulers of Judah. Uh, and that's a passage from Micah. Um, it was interesting that, that when the uh, Magi came looking for the new king that was, was to be born, they wound up in Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was a capital city, right? I mean, if a new king is going to be born, it, it would probably be born in a capital city. So they stopped there uh, on, on their way uh, to inquire of, of where this new baby was born. Um, Herod then calls all the chief priests together, and, and they, they quote from Micah 5, chapter 2, which we just read a little bit of. 
I want to kind of take a look at um, this whole section here, uh, verses 1 through 5. Uh, Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid on us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. Uh, what a great prophecy regarding the coming of the Messiah uh, and, and where he would be born. Uh, evidently, the Jewish people were, were fairly familiar with that passage, that, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Um, of course, the chief priests and, and teachers of the law knew it. But also in John chapter 7, when people were asking whether Jesus was the Christ, uh, some asked in verses 41, says so John 7, 41, 42, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? So people were familiar with that prophecy. They just weren't familiar with, with the birth of Jesus. They didn't know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He, he was brought up in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. So the prophecy, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Um, and we hear other prophecies that seem to contradict that. The Messiah will be called out of Egypt. The Messiah will be called the Nazarene. All these prophecies going around kind of contradict each other. It, it doesn't surprise me that the Jews might miss him as the Messiah, right? Uh, they, they might not recognize him because of all these different prophecies that seem to contradict each other. Uh, and, and let's face it, no one meeting him for the first time would, would know uh, about his past, about his birth, his early years uh, in, in Nazareth. Mary knew, and many scholars now believe that Mary helped Mark when, when he wrote his gospel, and that she probably collaborated with Matthew in writing his as well. Uh, I suspect this part probably came from Mary, uh, that that Matthew learned of the birth of Jesus from Mary. It probably wasn't something that came up in, in his discussions with, with the disciples. Uh, I doubt very much Jesus ever really discussed it too much. And I wonder really how much of this was really preached by the early Christians. Uh, there was a period of, of 30 to 60 years between Jesus and, and the writing of some of these Gospels and did they even know about Jesus' birth in Nazareth, or in, in Bethlehem, and then his fleeing to, uh, to Egypt, and then his coming out of Egypt, going into Nazareth? Uh, how many people even knew that? Uh, how many of the early Christians would have, would have known about that? Probably not very many. Uh, but there were more than 350 prophecies altogether fulfilled in Jesus and, and in no one else. So the first prophecy we saw this morning is that, that he was born in Bethlehem. The next one we see, uh, Matthew mentioned that Joseph was warned in a dream that, that Herod was going to kill the child. Uh, and so uh, he was told to take him to Egypt. So they got up in the middle of the night, he took his wife and, and the child, and they fled to Egypt. Uh, and we saw those words, and so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. <laughs> this one's actually uh, found in Hosea 11, verse 1. Uh, let's take a look at that one. It says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Um, this is kind of interesting that Matthew applied this to the birth of Jesus. Uh, it's a little bit difficult because Hosea isn't writing to give us prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. He's writing about a historical, uh, a historical event. 
Egypt was the place of refuge many times in the history of, of the Israelites. Many times they would go to Israel or Egypt when, when they were being threatened, uh, when they were in trouble. It was a place of, of refuge. In Genesis chapter 46, we're, we're probably all familiar with this one, Joseph um, and God preserved Jacob and, and his family, including Joseph, from a famine by giving them a place in Egypt. Uh, the brothers went down and found Joseph already established in Egypt, and, and they were able to ride out a famine there. Um, now, in that case, they became enslaved for 400 years before God finally called them out. That's what Hosea is referring to when he wrote those words in chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, calling uh, out of Egypt, uh, I called my son. There are other examples of fleeing to Egypt for safety too. In 1 Kings chapter 11, Jeroboam tries to rebel against King Solomon. He fails. King Solomon seeks revenge and Jeroboam runs to Egypt for refuge. In Jeremiah 26 verse 21, the prophet Uriah fled to Egypt when King uh, Jehoiakim tried to kill him. Another e example um, that, that they probably would have been familiar with, I'm sure we're probably not, but there's a series of books in, in some Bibles, most of ours probably don't have one, but it's called the Apocrypha. It's a series of books between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Catholic Bibles have them, Protestant Bibles usually don't. Um, they weren't included in the original Council of Nicaea as as part of the Bible, but they were added back in later in, in the Catholic Bibles at least as, uh, as useful and helpful books, but not necessarily uh, the same authoritative level as, as the, uh, the regular Bible. Um, since they weren't the original canon, Protestants largely reject them. But the early, again, the early Christians were familiar with them. And there's a book in there called Second Maccabees. It tells of a time when a high priest, Onias, tried to defend the temple treasures. The king was trying to uh, steal from the temple in order to get certain political favors from other kings. He was using temple money to pay off other kings. Uh, the king, King Antiochus, uh, had Onias killed. Uh, Onius' uncle killed, and then he came after Onius and was trying to kill him. Onius ran to Egypt for safety. Uh, it didn't quite work so well for Onius. He was hunted down in Egypt and killed there anyway. But, um, but again, he, he had that idea to get to Egypt for refuge. Um, all that being said, Matthew may have taken this prophecy out of context to apply it to Jesus. But, but there are strong similarities with other uh, moves to Egypt, trying to get down there for safety. Uh, God preserves them from certain death by providing a place to go to escape those who were after him. Uh, he can bring them out to fulfill his plans for them at a later date after the threat is over with. Just kind of another example of God's divine direction, uh, his directing the steps of those who would follow him. The next prophecy is, is another one that might be a little difficult to follow, um, is when Herod has all the male children under age two killed uh, as, as an attempt to destroy the child. Uh, this is found in Jeremiah 31, 15, which says, there it is, and I'm going to read 15 to 17 here. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. Now that's the part we read in Matthew. But that passage actually continues a little bit. It says, this is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. Now, we don't see all of that in Matthew. And, and Matthew is, uh, is said to be a prophecy fulfilled uh, there 
but it, it's really not writing about Herod killing children in Bethlehem. Uh, Rachel's crying for her children is either a reference to the captivity in, in the Assyrians in, in the early 720 BC or the Babylonians in 597 BC. But the lesson from Jeremiah isn't so much that Rachel is crying, but that God's message to her is to stop crying since the children are going to come back to the land. So there is hope. This is a message of hope. Um, this certainly wouldn't apply to the crying of, of the mothers of Bethlehem. Those children were never coming back, right? Um, but but he, in, in this case, he said this to give them hope that, that yes, the Christ is born. He's alive. He went to Egypt, but the hope is that he'll be back. The good news is that he'll be back. Uh, I want to point out something else in Matthew's wording between this prophecy and, and the other prophecies. Uh, in, in this one he said, and so was fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet. Did you notice that he left out the Lord's name in this one? He said, uh, that which was said by the prophet was fulfilled. What happened fulfilled scripture. But he doesn't want us thinking that, uh, that God would bring about the death of all those babies in Bethlehem um, just to fill a prophecy. God is good, and God doesn't cause evil things to happen. There is an evil one that would love nothing else than to stoop low enough to do anything that he could to, to take away the kingdom from God. Um, but the Lord didn't cause those children to die. The last prophecy, uh, he will be called the Nazarene. This is another one that, that looking outside of, of Matthew, we don't see that anywhere in scripture, that, that he would be called a Nazarene. Uh, there's no Old Testament references that he would be called a Nazarene. Um, no prophet in the Old Testament, as far as we know, ever said that the Christ would be, uh, would, would be called a Nazarene. So how do we account for that? How do we explain that prophecy? I guess there's a couple of, of options. Um, it, it's possible that Matthew was quoting from, from several different passages and kind of just mixed them up, combined them. Um, a second explanation was that he was citing from a book that, uh, that later Judaism and Christianity didn't feel was doctrinally sound enough to include in the Bible. It wasn't until 300 some uh, AD that the Council of Nicaea met and decided which books were going to be in the Bible. Which books were, were worthy enough, I guess, to make it into the Bible. So it could have been from another letter or book that was written um, that, that they didn't feel uh, was strong enough to, to be included in the final, uh, in the final account. Um, another option, maybe Matthew was familiar with a passage that said this. And you just couldn't recall the, the, the passage, so he just included it in here anyway, and, and kind of vague enough that, that it would be uh, seen, just attributed to the prophets. Last option, maybe Matthew uh, doesn't mean literally that the prophets said that he would be called a Nazarene, but just that, that, uh, that, that it was kind of assumed. I mean, uh, it, it was clear in the Old Testament that Jesus would be a humble and, and despised person. And Nazareth was kind of a humble and despised city. Uh, it's just natural they go together. So maybe that's why Matthew put them together. I don't know. Um, there's one other possibility too. Perhaps Matthew was thinking of Isaiah 11 verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. Now that doesn't mean much to us in English. But in Hebrew and Greek... The word for branch and the word for, uh, for Nazarene are very, very similar words. And it could be kind of like a play on words. Like in uh, when we see Jesus talking to Peter, your name is now Peter, which means Greek, which means in the Greek it means rock. Uh, your name is now rock and on this rock I will build my church. It could be just a play on words like that. I don't know. Um, it's... It's one of those passages that's kind of hard to reconcile. 
Because Matthew says it fulfills a prophecy, but that prophecy doesn't seem to be in Scripture anywhere, so how do we explain that? Um, my best guess, I, I think, is that there was probably another book that said he would be called a Nazarene that, that didn't make the Old Testament when they finally came around to decide which books were going to be in there. Um, I, I don't really know. But, but we have four different prophecies from Matthew all given that, that point to Jesus being the, disciple, the Messiah. They were all fulfilled in Jesus. He is the only one that could have fulfilled all of them. And, and his life proved that he was the Messiah. There's no one else that could have fulfilled not only those four prophecies, but the other 350 prophecies that, that, that talk about his life, death, and resurrection. Um, the way he lived his life proved that he was the one. No one else could take our sins and our imperfections and make us whole again. Uh, only Jesus. There could be no doubt, looking at all those prophecies, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. So what can we take from that? Um, it's kind of nice to dig into history a little bit, but, but what does it mean for us? Where, where do we go with that? Um, how about this? That Jesus' birth fulfills these prophecies because God directed Jesus' footsteps. When Jesus was a baby, God directed Mary and Joseph's footsteps. He directed the family to Bethlehem uh, using the census to do it so that the child would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. When Herod came looking for the child, he sent him down to, to, to Egypt to keep him safe, to protect the family. Um, we saw other examples of how God had done that in the past, sending people to Egypt for refuge. Um, when Herod was no longer a threat, God directed them back, again, appearing to them in a dream so they could, uh, could know that the way was uh, safe to come back. What we can learn here is that that's how God works. He directs our steps to keep us safe, to provide for us so that we can do his work. Don't rely on your own faculties to do God's work because God wants way more than that. He doesn't want what we can accomplish on our own. He wants what we can do with him. And with him we can do way more than we can do on our own. And, and that is the gospel message to us, isn't it? Uh, the good news that, that God, that Jesus is God's Son, sent to earth to deal with our sinfulness so that we can do the work of God. And that we can't do that work on our own. We need the indwelling Spirit. And, and we receive what we need when we cling to Christ. So look to God, cling to God, and let Him direct your steps. Listen to his word, his printed word, and, and, and his word, his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, in this passage, while none of these prophecies may seem crystal clear on, on their own, uh, they do lay the foundation that, that you do direct our steps so that we can do the work you brought us to. Let us look for that word, that, that, that plan earnestly. Help us to be always available to you always clinging to you to find the strength we need. In Jesus' name, amen.